and with the maternal beatitude. And in intercession of our Blessed Lady, in Jesus' holy name, we do pray. Amen. Amen. Bye. Bye. From our studios on Florida's Gulf Coast, this is Women of Grace Live. Join us today as we discuss issues important to your life and faith. Spiritual insight, compelling discussion, practical wisdom. Women of Grace, for such a time as this. Now, here's your host. Johnette Benkovic. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Women of Grace Live. I am Johnette Benkovic, and I am absolutely delighted, excited to be with you today as we discuss issues of importance to your life and faith. We certainly do have wonderful opportunities to come together Monday through Friday at this same time so that we can hear the voice of God, right? I mean, this is what we are all about, having holy conversation, asking the Holy Spirit to imbue our time together with His sweet presence, that we might be open and receptive to all that God wants to do in us and all that he wants to do through us during our time together. So I always invite you at the beginning of the program to share some time with us by calling us right here at Women of Grace Live. And if you are in North America, the number that you use is 800-585-9396. That's 800-585-9396. 96. That's the way you can join us live on Women of Grace Live if you're in North America. If you are outside of North America, then the number for you to use is this one, country code 1 205 271 2985. That's country code 1 205 271 2985. So pick up the phone, give us a call, share what's on your mind today, any inspiration or insight that you might have, as well as any question or comment that you would like to ask or make. In addition to that, did you know you can text us here? And it's always so much fun when we begin to receive texts right here on Women of Grace Live. So let me give you the text number to use. It's 55000. So, you know, all you do is you text EWTN to 55000, you wait for a response, and then you put your name in and your question, and voila, it pops up on my board. Still another way that you can join us is by going out there to EWTN Radio's YouTube channel. Did you know we're there for you? Yes, you get to see me. Oh my gosh. The only thing that I wish that they would come up with next, and I'm sure that they're going to do this, you know, like on YouTube, because you can do it with your phone, you know, kind of like a, like, sort of like a FaceTime on YouTube, you know, where you can just kind of look out there and you can see those individuals that are joined with you there. That would be so much fun from my perspective. But at any rate, we're out there for you on EWTN Radio's YouTube channel. So you can go out there on YouTube and you can watch and you can join in the community that gathers there and you can ask questions that way. And it once again pops right up on my board here and we're able to discuss those issues uh, that you're questioning and that you have, um, you know, some kind of, uh, what's the word that I want to use? Some kind of... um, you know, uh, perhaps doubt about or whatever the case is, we're here for you today. And that makes me very, very glad. Um, If you're with us by YouTube, you see I'm looking around here for a few little things. I wanted to answer a question for Teresa. And that's what I've been looking for. I I thought I was going to find something in this one book that would be more articulate maybe than what I have to share. But the fact of the matter is I didn't come up with it. So you're just going to have to get my answer, Teresa, to your question. And we're going to start right off with this at the beginning, because I think it's a question that a lot of people have. Yesterday, Teresa, who was with us via YouTube, and hopefully she's there again with us, um, had a question. And she said she's just been reading St. Faustina's diary. And it's been so helpful to her, so beneficial. It's really given her illumination. But uh, St. Faustina talks about the talkative soul. And she wants wanted to know what to do about the talkative soul. So, well, first of all, we have to understand what a talkative soul is, you know. Uh, a talkative soul basically is is um, when we enter into our time of prayer that, that all kinds of distractions come along. There's three faculties in the soul. Why don't we start with that? Because this will be kind of fun to talk about. There's three faculties in the soul. that Our soul has these three faculties, and in some way they... Uh, these three faculties uh, help for us to be made in the image and 
likeness of God. These are these are endowments that God has given to us that are a reflection of his own divine life. Now that's nicely put. So what are they? Well, it's the intellect, right? It's our will and it's our emotion slash imagination. All right. So we've got this gift of, of, of our intellect. We've got the gift of imagination and emotions, and we have the gift of, of free will. So it is a question of the soul when we enter into prayer that we get distracted. And it, in that typically comes from, uh, you know, the intellect and it comes, you know, because we start thinking about a bunch of things. And in addition to that, it also comes from the imagination. You know, our imaginations will take over and sometimes we're, you know, like all the way down the highway there and we realize, oh my gosh, you know, I, I, I am so far away from, from where I was a minute ago and maybe it was five minutes ago. I don't even know because I've been on this little, you know, mental journey. I've been daydreaming, right? Uh, and, and so, there's, there's that aspect. And then sometimes the emotions can clog up our capacity to receive things from God. And we've got to quell all of these things. You know, we've got to pull them underneath, uh, uh, you know, the reign of our will, the third faculty of the soul, so that we can enter into this time of prayer. So that's what a talkative soul is. And I'm thinking that we all suffer from this from time to time. I'm raising my hand right here because I can tell you, even last night I was sitting there and I was saying, oh Lord, I am so distracted. You know, look at this. You know, I, I think I was falling asleep, frankly. I think I began to dream. <laughs> I was like, oh dear, I'm dreaming. This isn't good. I'm praying. So anyway, we, we all suffer from this. And all of the saints of the church that are canonized suffered from this. You know, no one is without distraction. It's part of the battle of prayer. The Catechism of the Catholic Church gives us this beautiful, beautiful uh, teaching on, on Christian prayer, what Christian prayer truly consists of. And it talks about that prayer is a battle. And that's interesting because I don't think that we think about that, right? So naturally, when we sit down to have communion with God, you know, the, the forces of, of hell are not happy about this. So they do their best to incite all kinds of things into our mind. But but our own human condition typically is the major culprit here. Uh, and we have to battle ourselves, right? It's a battle of ourselves to gain supremacy, superiority over those passions of ours that would seek to lead us in directions that would take us out of the presence of God. So what we want to do, uh, and when I say out of it, I don't mean that God leaves us. He never does. But but we basically fall away from the acknowledgement of his presence ever before us. So how do we, what do we do? Well, the first thing I think that we ought to take a look at to quiet and still the soul uh, is, is um, given to us by St. Teresa of Avila. Excellent advice. She says, you know, just acknowledge the fact that you're distracted. You know, it, it, the more that you try to battle the distraction, the worse it gets. Because now you're distracted by the distraction and you're distracted in battling the distraction. So now you've got the initial distraction and you've got this, you know, great big war that you're waging against the distraction. The best thing to do is just to not pay any attention to the distraction. It comes, but we, we, we control, you know, um, our, our, our interiority and we take control of it in the sense of, of just bringing it back to the focus of our prayer time right? Bringing ourselves back to a state of recollection. That is a matter of the will. And this especially happens, you know, I think um, when we perhaps are beginning a life of prayer, but also in the midst of a life of prayer. Maybe we've been on this journey for a very long time, but oftentimes I think this rages when we're, how do I want to say this? When we're on the cusp of of a new entry into the depth of prayer. And so it's it's a resistance, basically, to move forward. And sometimes that resistance, as I say, comes from the evil one, but sometimes it comes from ourselves because we begin to sense something changing. And maybe we've had this comfort level in our time of prayer, right? And so we don't really want to see that interrupted. We don't really want for a change to come because we don't know what it's going to require of us. And it also means that we've got to learn about this new phase. And it's kind of like a starting over, uh, in a sense. Even though it's a deepening, it's a new place. It's kind of like moving, you know, like from elementary school into middle school. 
We really don't know what that's going to be like. It can be very scary. There's going to be new bands. We might have to change classes. <gasps> I might have my own locker. Exciting but scary. What if I can't open it? Oh my goodness. What if I leave the books in my locker and they're not on my desk? And then what am I going to do? And then we begin to get ourselves all wound up about things. Do you see what I'm saying? So it's a new beginning. Uh, there's an anticipation, but by the same token, there's also an apprehension. We're a little afraid. So sometimes there's an interior resistance uh, that, that, that rises up. So Teresa Vavula says, just ignore them. She says, they're like little flies that buzz about the head, you know? Um, you know, just do what you do with those little flies, you know, just, uh, you know, just wave your hand at them, you know, just, just don't pay any t- attention to them. Don't get yourself all jammed up about them. Just let them go and return to what it is that is at hand, your conversation with the Lord. And maybe at that point in time, this is another good technique, Teresa, you know, shift the way in which you're praying. For example, if you're praying the rosary and you're abundantly distracted, it is a long prayer. It can happen. You know, um, start to pray it out loud and ponder the words that you're praying out loud. Hail Mary full of grace. Mother, you are full of grace. What is that fullness like? What must have been the the uh, beautiful reality of your soul? How even before the overshadowing of the Holy Spirit, were you already reflecting the goodness of God? Mother, take me into that fullness. Help me to experience it. Ask your spouse, the Holy Spirit, to imbue me with a portion of that fullness, just the smallest of tastes, so that I can come to know you and understand you better. And I can come to see this terrestrial paradise, which is your most immaculate heart. Take me there, Mother. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Ah, there it is, Mother. It was God's action in you. What is God's action in me? See, and then what happens is, you know, those distractions... Even if that, you know, bee is buzzing in your head, you're paying it no mind. And, and, and you're captivated by this, this beautiful gift of recollection that's utilizing your imagination and your intellect to take you more deeply into prayer. Another thing that you can do sometimes is to seek to make the prayer your own in the sense that you, you strive to picture yourself in a conversation, for example, in the rosary with Our Lady. Picture our mother sitting there and you're talking with her. So you actually change the cadence, you know, the tone, uh, the, 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 um, the, the speed at which you are praying, you know. And sometimes you just say, Mother, I just want to sit with you for a moment. And you just sit there. What, what does it matter if it takes you, you know, 10 minutes to pray a Hail Mary? So what if it takes you an entire hour to pray a Hail Mary? What does it matter? Because now you've, you've really achieved, you know, through the grace of God, you've achieved this, this beautiful, beautiful union with the one you love. And so, you know, those would be just a few suggestions that you could begin to implement to still the soul. Change your posture, you know. Change whatever um, methodology of praying you're about in that moment. Uh, you know, uh, pick up the Bible. If, if you're praying the rosary and you're stuck in there, you know, and, and you're very distracted, you know, go to scripture and, and read the passage about the mystery that you're on, you know, then do Lexio with it and then return, you know, or if you're doing Lexio and you get really distracted, just say, Lord, I'm really distracted, you know, help me to find, you know, a key here. Let me see what you're saying to me in this. Is there a key word here that you want to speak to me? Make my heart sensitive to it so that I can ponder it in you. And these are just some of the little ways in which you can begin to still the soul. And then sometimes, just got to tell you, Teresa, sometimes the entire prayer time is nothing but distraction, distraction, distraction. And then you just say to the Lord, Lord, you know, I'll tell you. I tried to give you as much as I could give you today, but you know the humility of my situation. You know my impoverished spirit here. And you've been with me and you've seen it. But I have given you the gift of my presence. I have suffered through this prayer time. But I've suffered through it in love of you. 
and please accept what I could give you there. And may it be a joy to your heart and soul and may it be emblematic of the love that I have for you. All of that I think will help you out. Well, I've given you a long answer to that. Look at how long I have spoken already and I've only given you the numbers once. Let me give them to you again. 800-585-9396. It's 800-585-9396. That's the way you can join us live here on Women of Grace Live today. I'm Janet Bankovic. So happy to be with you. If you're outside of North America, 1205-271-2985. It's 1205-271-29. Eight five. That's the way that you can join us. If you're outside of North America, you can text us. Text EWTN to five five zero zero zero. Get out there to EWTN Radio's YouTube channel. I'm there for you too. We're going to be right back. Stay with us. The wisdom of Mother Angelica. Tonight, I want you to repent of something. I want you to ask God for something. Lord, I ask for your mercy tonight. Lord, I ask for your providence tonight. Lord, I ask for your understanding tonight. Lord, I ask for your kindness. And then you can do something else. You could say, Lord, I need to be gentle. Give me gentleness. Lord, I need to be charitable. I don't know how to love, Lord. I don't know how to be kind. Lord, I need to be honest. Lord, I need to slow down. I'm busy, 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 and I don't have time for you. Lord, I want to make time for you, and I want you to teach me how to make time. For more information on Mother Angelica, visit Religious Catalog at EWTNRC.com. Looking for a unique setting for spiritual renewal at a religious shrine so beautiful it had to be divinely inspired? And the world's largest religious media network? Start your Catholic pilgrimage today with EWTN. Call 205-271-2966. Hi, this is Trent Horn from Catholic Answers Live. Some skeptics ask, how could a virgin give birth to the Son of God? Without God's intervention, she couldn't. But if God were powerful enough to make a universe from nothing, then why reject his ability to become man in the womb of his mother Mary? This Christmas, let's pray for skeptics to encounter the real reason for the season, our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Welcome back, friends. You're listening to Women of Grace Live. I'm Janet Benkovic, and I am very, very happy to be with you here today as we have Holy Conversation together. Phone lines are open for you. Phone lines are lighting up. We want you to light them up, too. Let me give you a number that you can use. If you're in North America, it's 800-585-9396. It's 800-585-9396. Nine, six. If you're outside of North America, here's your number. Country code 1205-271-2985. That's 1205-271-2985. That's the way you can join us on Women of Grace Live if you're outside of North America. You can text us 55000. That's the way you do it. Just put in 55000. Then wait for the response. Put in your name and your question and it comes up. And we're so happy to be with you out there at EWTN radio's youtube channel uh we've got mike on the phone he's calling us from boston this morning listening to us via station of the cross how are you doing today mike hi Jeanette. thanks so much for taking my call Hi. oh i'm so happy you called thank you very much and what's going on with you today well Jeanette, i i when you when you pray with people it's really inspiring to me and it's always been a a, a real source of uh um, faith for me, so I was hoping that you could say a little prayer for my wife and I, who are actually civilly married, but we'll be having our marriage blessed in the church on the 10th of December. Oh, Mike, I'm so excited for you. Praise be to God that you're taking this step, having your marriage blessed. All of those graces of the sacrament of matrimony are just going to pour down upon you. They're going to rain down from heaven. And I just know this is going to be so, so very beautiful for you and your wife as you come into this new moment in your life together, a moment now that incorporates Jesus as the center figure of your relationship. Oh, God God be praised for that, Mike. I would be happy happy to pray for the two of you. Uh, and, and I will remember you on December the 10th because that's the birthday of my little twin grandsons. So um, oh, I will think of you in a very special way on that day. I'm going to tie the two together. Well, Father God, we do come before you in this moment and we lift Mike 
up to you. And we lift his civil wife up to you, his fiance of the church. Uh, we lift her up to you too. And Father, I am so, so grateful that through the power of the Holy Spirit, you have put this desire in the heart of Mike and in the heart of his bride to come together now as husband and wife underneath the sacramental graces of the church. I would ask that in this moment, heaven release those graces in a powerful way upon Mike and his bride. I would pray that they would be imbued to overflowing with every spiritual blessing in the heavens that you desire that they receive. What joy must be in your heart, Father God, to see your son and your daughter making this commitment to each other in you, a covenantal relationship now that will exist outside of time and space because it's part of the eternal moment gifted to us through the sacrament. Oh, my Lord, I am so, so, so excited for you, Lord, and for Mike and for his bride and for what this means to the Church of Christ, the Bride of Christ. And so, Father, we do ask for this blessing to be bestowed upon them through the merits of the cross of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. I pray that that this coming together in, in this blessed covenantal relationship will be a sign and a witness to all of those who will be there witnessing this moment. I pray that their witness would be an encouragement for them in their own life of faith, in their own marriages. I pray that if there is anyone who is in attendance that is outside of the sacramental bond, but is living together uh, in, in a union that, that has not been sacramentalized, that this will serve as, as, as a, what do I want to say, as a, as a beautiful invitation from you to them to enter into this beautiful covenantal relationship that comes through the sacrament of matrimony. And I would pray that they would be inspired by it and that they would sense it and that accompanying that gift, there would be, um, you know, a zeal, a holy zeal to follow suit. We thank you for what you've been doing in the heart of Mike and his bride. And we ask that this good work that you have begun in them would be brought to full completion. And I thank you again for all that you are doing and for all that you have yet to do. And so it is that we raise this couple up to you, Father God, in the name of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, by the merits of his cross, through the power of the Holy Spirit, and with the maternal beatitude and intercession of our Blessed Lady. Amen. May God be praised, Mike. Thank you so very much for the step that you're taking. Amen. Thank you so much. You're welcome, good man of God. Yeah, and you know, I don't know, maybe you're hearing this prayer, and maybe you're listening to Mike, and you're seeing the step that he and his bride are going to take, and maybe you too are in an, irre- in, in an irregular marriage right now. Maybe you're in a marriage that's not blessed by the church for any number of reasons. Maybe you just didn't want to get married in the church at the time. Maybe you didn't want to go through the process that the church sets up so that we can understand more deeply what the sacrament is about. Maybe, in fact, you are divorced, and now you're remarried, and your first marriage wasn't uh, uh, taken care of, um, at least in the sense of looking to see if it was eligible for a decree of nullity. Uh, Maybe you've persisted in a relationship outside of the bonds of marriage through cohabitation. You know, if any of that applies to you, You know, I want to personally invite you to come back to the fullness of life in Christ Jesus. I I personally want to invite you as a daughter of the church to enter into the covenantal bond that God would have you know. I would ask you to make things right. And I would ask you that you would be open and receptive to the way in which God wants to work in you afresh and in you. I want to encourage you to be brave, to have coraggio, courage, to have perseverance, to embrace long-suffering if necessary, but to let nothing, nothing interrupt your relationship with God. So, hear the invitation Ask the Lord what he would have you do with that invitation. And then make haste. Make haste to respond. 
You're listening to Women of Grace Live. I'm Johnette Benkovic, 800-585-9396 is the way you can join us if you're in North America. It's 800-585-9396. Pick up the phone, give us a call. We're eager to hear from you here. If you're outside of North America, your number is country code 1-205-271-2985. You can text your question to 55000. Wait for the response, put your name in and your comment or question and up it comes on my board. Or you can join us via EWTN Radio's YouTube channel and submit a question that way too. Now we've got some individuals who have texted us today. So we're going to go right there. You see, they're not afraid to use that text feature. You shouldn't be either. Here's Anna. Anna says, what do you do when you have temptation to feel anger because your kindness was taken advantage of or you were betrayed? Well, Anna, I'll tell you, let's just face it. Anger is an emotion and all of us experience it from time to time. The fact that anger is an emotion and the fact that God created the emotions tells us that God, you know, in some way permits us to experience anger. The question isn't whether or not we feel anger or get angry. The question is, what do we do with that anger? So anger in and of itself is not a sin. So the temptation to anger, mm, I'm not sure that I would phrase it that way. Um, Because anger just wells up in us. You know what I mean? It isn't something that we plan for. It's not something that we create. It's not something that we look to do. Well, today, I think I'm going to concentrate on being angry. (laughs) I mean, I don't think people wake up in the morning thinking that. Um, That would be a very sour condition, wouldn't it? Oh, my goodness sakes. That would take a lot of healing. I just think that anger wells up. And it wells up maybe for, you know, the reasons that you stated. Uh, These would be two very good reasons that would cause anger to well up. And what do you tell us? You feel it because you think that your kindness was taken advantage of, or you feel that you were betrayed. That's going to incite anger. But as I say, that isn't the sin. Now, the temptation is to act on the anger or to brood about the affront that you experienced, or to ruminate on it, you know, to spend time with it, uh, allowing it to create within our heart and our soul bitterness and resentment. Now that is sin, okay? So I want to clarify the difference between you feel anger, that isn't a sin, but then giving into the anger, expressing it in a wrong-headed way or a wrong-minded way, now that now there there we've entered into sin. So what do you do in in these cases? Well, I'll tell you what we'll do. I, I think that what we ought to do is to do what Jesus told us to do, and He's very clear and specific. He says, "Pray for our persecutors, pray for them." So anytime the anger wells up, and you're tempted to brood over it, or you're tempted to recall the whole sordid story, what is the solution? The solution Jesus gives us is this, pray for the one who hurt you. I know it isn't easy. And I know that we might not want to do that. And I know that it really costs us to enter into it. And I know our prayer might not even be coming from absolutely pure motives because maybe we're just praying because Jesus said we have to do it and we're gritting our teeth and we're bearing through it, you know, but that's all right. That's all right. There is still a surrender that's involved with that. And what does God do? He sees the surrender. And that surrender creates a little opening. And that little opening that is created by it permits God to begin to inject grace into our soul. Grace into our soul. And what is the grace that he would give us specific to that moment? He would give us the grace of mercy. He would give us his mercy for the person. Now, a funny thing begins to happen. Even if it's just the weest of seeds of mercy, as we continue to pray for the one who's injured us, that seed begins to take root and it begins to germinate. And just to remind us again, what is that seed? It's the mercy of God. It's God's love for that person who has affronted, betrayed, or taken advantage of us. That's what it is. It's his love for that person. And that seed takes root, begins to germinate, and then it grows. And pretty soon, what happens in that hardened place in our heart is that a little sprout 
pushes through. And that little sprout begins to bear fruit. And pretty soon, our human love, compassion for that person, begins to blend with God's love. And we begin to experience the effects of forgiveness. So that's what I would do. Just follow what Jesus has taught us. Pray for our persecutor. Well, I'll tell you what, here, you hear that music, we're going to go to a break. When we come back, more right here on Women of Grace Live. You can join us at 800-585-9396. It's 800-585-9396. Stay tuned. Living the Beatitudes with Father Bjorn. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. While purity is an important virtue, a lot of times we can confuse this beatitude for discussion about sexual morality. To be pure in heart is to be completely focused on and in love with God. God has given us an invitation deep within us to share in His own divine life. But it's important that we choose to focus on Him and respond to that invitation. In a homily on the Mount of Beatitudes in 2000, St. John Paul the Great says that, We are called to have an urgent response to choose between life and death. In one of the earliest known Christian documents on morality, the Didache, it says there are two ways, one of life and one of death, and between the two ways is a great difference. God has called us to be focused on Him and His love. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. EWTN. Live Truth. Live Catholic. And I'm Doug Keck, and welcome to an EWTN Bookmark Brief. I just finished interviewing Teresa Tamio on her new book, Intimate Graces, How Practicing the Works of Mercy Brings Out the Best in Marriage. Give us a synopsis of what this book's about, and who is Dominic Pastore, who co-wrote it with you? That's my husband, Deacon Dominic, and we wrote this together, and we're very excited. It's about applying the corporal and spiritual works of mercy to your marriage, which I never thought of before until we were approached by our publisher and our editor at Ave Maria Press. And when you stop and think about feeding the hungry, clothing the naked, visiting those in prison or ransoming the captive, and you think about it in terms of marriage, especially troubled marriages, they do make a lot of sense, and you can really draw a lot out of them to improve and strengthen marriage. Very good. As an author, of course, host on EWTN as well as on EWTN Radio, thank you so much, Teresa Tamio. Intimate Graces, How Practicing the Works of Mercy Brings Out the Best in Marriage, co-authored with her husband, Dominic Pastore, and it's available through the EWTN Religious Catalog, and this has been an EWTN Bookmark Brief. Welcome back, friends. You're listening to Women of Grace Live. I'm Johnette Benkovic. Very happy to be with you today, inviting you to give us a call here on Women of Grace Live. You can do that if you're in North America by punching in these numbers, 800-585-9396. It's 800 800- Five eight five nine three nine six. That's the way that you can join us live here on Women of Grace Live. If you're in North America, be sure to say hello to Tom Price today. He is call screening for us today. He's director of programming. You know him too from uh, EWTN Live, and we invite you to say howdy, hey, to Tom Price as you give us a call at eight hundred five eight five ninety three ninety six. In addition to that, you can call us at two zero five two seven one. 2985. If you're outside of North America, that's country code 1. 205-271-2985. Producing today for us is Jeff Burson. And he is the guy that takes care of that EWTN Radio's YouTube channel. So he's doing double duty for us today. Do want to tell you something. I, I, I have to say this. Uh, you know, I am very, very excited about the fact that as we are approaching Advent, we're thinking about beautiful opportunities, uh, very nice things that that we can offer and give for uh, to our loved ones, right? And I've been sharing with you that you know you want to pass on things of faith. You know, th- this is how I feel anyway. I don't know how you feel. We want we want to pass on things of faith, but sometimes it's nice to. Pro- uh, pass on very practical items too, you know. And I wanted to tell you a little bit about Religious Catalog. Uh, it's, a, it's a great opportunity for you to do some of your early shopping. want to share with you about my book, Graceful Living. It's available for you out there at EWTNRC.com. Beautiful book. I, I just really love it. Uh, EWTN Publishing uh, has has given this book, and it is a little hardback book. It's a beautiful size, 506 pages, meditations for every day of the liturgical calendar, 
meant to help you grow in your relationship with God. Daily reflections accompany them. Uh, the cover is soft and lovely to touch. It's a hard cover, but what I mean by soft is that it's really silky to touch. In addition to that, the pages are the same way. It's just a beautiful, beautiful item that I think will help individuals to enter into the abundant life of Jesus Christ and to share that abundant life with others. But I also want to tell you about something practical that's out there for you at EWTNRC.com. And you know what that is? It is the EWTN 20 ounce tumbler. Now I have one here on my desk uh, where I do the programming every day with you. And I put my beverage in here. Sometimes it's water. Sometimes it's a soft drink. Sometimes it's coffee. It all depends upon the moment. And I, you know, I took a nice drink, (laughs) a nice drink during the break. And you know, I, the, And why is that important? It's important because I filled this up prior to the program starting. And this EWTN 20 ounce tumbler, it keeps everything really cold up to four hours or really hot up to four hours. And, uh, you know, when I took that sip, it was so refreshing. Today, it happens to be a soda. I admit it. It's a soda. And I took a sip and, oh, it felt, you know, just like I had just poured it. It tasted so nice and so cool. So I want to recommend this to you. It's a lovely gift. And It's also sharing the faith and the good news about EWTN because it's got the EWTN logo on it. And it is the EWTN 20 ounce tumbler. And it's item number 66887, 66887. Just saying, it's a great stocking stuffer. Another thing that's fun about these kinds of gifts, now I'm going to give you some little tips on, uh, you know, Christmas and what you can do that's kind of fun. You could take a little, uh, you know, item like this, take the lid off of it, and you could stuff it with other little items that you get at religious catalog, you know, like you could put a rosary in there, you could put a little rosary book in there, you could put, uh, you know, some uh, holy cards would would fit neatly into that, Uh, some different kinds of bookmarks, you could certainly put a gift certificate in there, all kinds of neat little things, a keychain. I mean, just think of it. You could just load it up with EWTN logo stuff. I guess I'm getting a little crazy right now, but I'm just saying you could do that and then you could wrap it all up. And when the person receives it, they take the lid off. You know, it's all these little fun things that are on the inside. Anyway, uh, just a little thought for you. Uh, let's go back to our phone lines here. But before we do that, I want to uh, acknowledge um, someone else who has texted us today. And we've got Will from Kalamazoo, Michigan. And he says, I'm trying to get into my parish's RCIA program. Um, let's see, this just scooted down on me a minute. So let me just go back to dear Will. He says he's trying to get into his parish's RCIA program and he never attended an actual mass. Can I get some pointers? Well, Will, isn't that a beautiful thing uh, that you are in the RCIA program or you're wanting to get involved with RCIA? That means you have an interest in coming into the faith or at least you want to learn more about the Catholic faith. I really want to commend you on that. For all of you out there that are listening and perhaps you have lacked catechesis in your life for one reason or another, maybe you received your, your baptism and no other sacraments of initiation Maybe you received all the sacraments of initiation, but you know your family didn't really practice the faith, or you didn't go on to learn about the faith through CCD or some other program. Well, the fact of the matter is, RCIA is for you too, because you'll learn a great deal about the faith through RCIA. I know my daughter went through RCIA with her husband when he was coming into the church, and she learned a whole lot. And you know, she said, "Mom, it's just been so interesting for me." And she was catechized, you know. But there's always more for us to learn, and this is the beautiful thing. So if you just feel like you need a shot in the arm with regard to your faith, RCIA, even if you are a practicing Catholic, is available for you too. But well, what do you do? You've never attended an actual Mass. Well, I want to recommend that you go, right? And here's a good thing. In most of the churches, you're going to have a missalette that's there. You open that missalette and you go to the to the liturgical date that we're on. They're going to, it's going to have the date of the of the Sunday Mass right there for you. And you uh, you can follow along, right? Right there with the prayers of the church, and there's actually directives that tell you when to sit, when to kneel, when to stand. It gives you all of that good information right there in the missalette. Now, I would suggest this. I would suggest that you pay a visit to the church prior to Mass. Just stop in on your way home from work one day or, you know, on your lunch hour or, you know, some other time and pick up the missalette. It is customary for Catholics to genuflect before the Blessed Sacrament. That's the tabernacle. You'll know where it is by the red light. Genuflect. You know, you go down on on your right knee. uh, And we make the sign of the cross when we genuflect. You can do that too. I'm sure you've been practicing the sign of the cross. Know how to make that. And then just go into the pew and, and sit down. Jesus is there, body, blood, soul, and divinity. 
Tell him you're presenting yourself to him today. It's a little prayer. And tell him that you want to learn more about, about this great, great prayer that he's given us, the, the summit of our spiritual life, the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. Open the missalette up for the next Sunday or the Sunday that you'll be attending and you know begin to read through it so that you're familiarized with it. And then when you go into Mass on, on Sunday morning, you'll be prepared and, and you'll feel more comfortable about the whole thing. So, you know, you can do that. And it's all right to admit to the person sitting next to you, this is the first time that I've attended Mass. You know, can you guide me through a little bit? My goodness. I, I just have a real feeling that that would bring great grace into their lives and might even stimulate them to learn more about their faith. So those are my suggestions to you, good man. And I just want to welcome you to the family. I want to welcome you to this beautiful, beautiful gift that God is giving to you. All righty, we want you to give us a call here, 800-585-9396. I also have a beautiful little thing I want to share with you about. Uh, Margarita is watching on YouTube from India this morning. So Margarita, we say hello to you. And get this, she is watching along with her husband and her six children. So Margarita, we say Congratulations for being so so studious about the faith that, that you want to bring your whole family into a deeper understanding of our life in Jesus Christ. I'm giving you a big wave right now to you and to your husband and to your six children. Hi, kids. How are you doing? And thank you for joining us. That is such a lovely, lovely thing to hear. Just absolutely beautiful. Uh, Teresa who we started our program with today, is writing in. She is with us also via YouTube. She says, Through the diary of St. Faustina, I realized I was a lukewarm soul. Through St. Faustina's words and the Lord's grace every day, I feel I'm being helped on my spiritual journey. Well, I am so happy, Teresa, and I hope that uh, our little words uh, are effective for you in, in fighting distraction. And when we talk about a lukewarm soul, it's, in, it's important for us to understand what that means. We read in Revelation that that God is going to puke out of his mouth lukewarm souls. I mean, that's a very big statement, right? God does not like a lukewarm soul. He wants for us to be red hot in love with him, right? He doesn't want for us to be in some middle place because when we're in a middle place, which is what lukewarmness is, tepidity of soul, we stand a very good chance of falling backward. If our soul is lukewarm, we're already questioning the goodness of God, his providence, maybe even doubting his existence. So when we are given the gift, which you've been given, Teresa, of illumination of heart, it's a gift. When you've been given the gift of illumination of heart and you see that you're lukewarm and you recognize it for what it is, it is a big hallelujah day. You had to jump up and sing and dance around and praise God because he is letting you see that there is more for you and he's calling you, calling you, pulling upon your heart with cords of love to enter more deeply into union with him. So how do we then begin to cooperate with that grace? How do we exercise the will to lead us into a fervency of heart and desire for God, realizing that we're all going to go through periods of dryness where we might not feel the emotions, right? Where we might not uh, experience this, this loving zeal for God. That, that's aridity. What do we do? Well, here's what we do when we are able to diagnose the fact through the grace of God that our soul is lukewarm. We step up our time of prayer. First of all, if we're lukewarm, chances are we don't even have a time of prayer. So we begin a time of prayer. We set aside a portion of the day where we're going to come before him for at least five minutes. Now that's not very long, but it's realistic, isn't it? Especially if you're not used to praying on a regular basis. Five minutes can seem like an eternity, but it's a realistic chunk of time. You come before him and you come prepared. You come prepared to meet him. And I always say, come prepared to meet him through the word of God. Open your Bible. Read a passage. Let that passage begin to work in you. Spend that, those five minutes asking God's question about that passage. For example, take John 10.10. 10. I have come that they might have life and have it more abundantly. 
sit there with it. Talk to Jesus. Say, Jesus, you know, you're saying in this passage that you've come to give me life. Okay, I have life. What kind of life are you talking about? And tell me, why is that life more abundant than the life I'm living now? What is the abundant life, Lord? And then give him a chance to respond, right? Don't just keep chatting at him. Hush up and listen. Listen, listen, listen. Way down deep in the bottom of your heart. Listen for the voice of God. He'll speak through our thought process. Sometimes even communicate to us right there in our heart through words that are not words. An intimation of the heart. Sometimes he'll even accompany that with little sensate consolations. Like you'll feel a warmth. You'll at least experience in some way the reality that he has heard your prayer and he is responding. So that's what I would do uh, if you have a lukewarm soul. Then you're going to notice that you begin to uh, look forward to those times and your day doesn't feel quite right without them. That's a very good sign because it means now that you're moving from lukewarmness into, you know, um, a, 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 what do I want to say? Uh, a, you know, like a hotter relationship with the Lord, right? You're entering more deeply into communion with him. And you're not really lukewarm anymore. You're warmer than that. You might not be burning hot, but you're warmer than that. And God will continue to move forward. All right, we're going to go to Liz. She's calling us from Pleasanton, Kansas. She's listening to us via FM 93.7. Good morning, Liz. How are you? I'm fine. How are you? I'm doing very well. Thank you for asking. taking my call. You're welcome. What's Uh, going on with you, honey? Well, I am kind of desperate at this point. Um, Uh. My husband and I were... um, married about a year and a half ago and mm-hmm. he's the best man he's the best person i've ever known okay. um but we have experienced trial after trial after trial and um we've been separated since um like the end of august oh. and at this point like i've done i feel like i've done everything i can do um I'm still praying, but I feel like I'm running out of faith. Um, oh, and I feel baby. like the more my faith has grown, extremely, extremely powerful. But I feel like every, the more, the more evil I come across, like the more bad occurrences that happen, and just it doesn't make sense to me. And it so, just, oh, baby, well, let, let me ask you a couple of questions, okay? So when you talk about these trials, are these trials from the exterior or the interior? Are they, they, um, the trials of circumstance and situation, trials of finance? They all kind of spin from my past. Um, I was, I've got like, I don't know, 15 years of domestic abuse. Um, which from kind your of father? Carried over. Um, yeah, and a previous husband. Okay. Um, and so it, I, it, it, I didn't know. Um, I had some symptoms of post-traumatic stress that I hadn't mm-hmm. dealt with um, until it got really bad, and then the day of our wedding was a disaster, and oh. um, and it's oh. just, and my husband's hurt really, really, really bad because of me, and um, I've been good. praying. I'm praying that... Um, Liz, um, are you... The, are you uh, baby... I, I'm so happy you're praying. I, I mean, that is so I, important. That's and, all and, I have. Like, yeah, and and I and I, you know, I obviously every one of us listening, uh, me included, hears the emotion in your voice and how difficult this is. And this is, I, I want to give you some assurance, Liz. First, I want to tell you this, honey. God has brought out into the light what's been hidden in the darkness for a very long time. Okay. He's brought out into the light this post-traumatic stress that you have suffered as a result of the abuse that you have experienced at the hands of your father and at the hands of your first husband. And for it's just what... like there's just more that just keeps happening that doesn't oh. even have to do with that. Okay, so, but, but let, let's talk about this because we all have trials and, and we all face difficulties. And married life 
is a vocation, which means that it's the path that God has chosen for us that we might be purified and, and sanctified. So there's always going to be issues in marriage, but you have a fundamental issue here, which I think probably curtails your capacity and perhaps your husband's to deal with the other normal stresses that come from married life. So, so this, in a certain sense, is a linchpin. And, and, and God is bringing this to light because he wants to heal those wounds of your heart. He wants to affect change in you. He, he wants, he wants to, to bring you to the fullness of life that he intends for you to receive. And he does not want for you to be governed um, by or controlled by these wounds anymore. Now, I want you to hear what I'm saying, Liz. When we have very serious wounds of the heart, and you're describing very serious wounds of the heart. When you have very serious wounds of the heart, unless those wounds are healed, we operate out of those wounds. Okay? They affect the way in which we see the world, and they affect the way in which we see ourselves in the world. And ultimately, we act out of a false notion, a false idea. We act out of our pain. We might not realize it, because in so many cases, those methods and behaviors that have built up over the years have been a type of defense mechanism that's protected us from the pain. And, and it's become a way of life for us. So we, we don't even see it anymore. But see, here's the thing. You've been given the grace now to understand how, how severely affected you've been. And God doesn't want it to cost your marriage. He doesn't want it to cost the marriage. I know, baby. So I, I want to ask you this question, honey. You know, are you in counseling? Oh, yeah. I I've, I've actually, I was in intensive outpatient therapy last summer. And again, this summer, for like eight weeks at a time, I've been seeking a lot of spiritual counseling most of my time. But I'm okay. also seeing an EMDR therapist to, um, to help with the symptoms of the stress. Okay. All right. Now, are you, are you cooperating with what they're telling you to do? I'm assuming oh, yeah. you are. Good, oh, good, yeah. good, good, good. Okay. Let me ask you this. Is this cyclical, Liz? Does, do, do, do these moments of, of, of deep emotional travail, um, you know, come and then go, or, or are they constant? And when they, when they come back, are they more severe than they were prior to? Actually, those symptoms have really subsided quite significantly. Okay. Um, but it's more like an intense, constant pain of just missing my husband. Of course. And Okay, so so okay, so yeah. I mean, you're you're so this has caused a split in the marriage already, right? Yeah. Okay, so but he's you're separated, correct? Yep. Now, is he seeing a counselor? No. Okay. Well, it seems to me that this would be a very good thing to do if, if, if the two of you want to save this marriage, would be for the two of you to see a counselor as well. You need therapy, but so does he. And he needs to learn coping skills um, for himself, but also he needs to, to learn skills that, that can be employed to help you when these moments rise up. And, and without that component, I think it's going to be very hard to move forward. So I, I want to encourage you to talk with your counselor and your spiritual counselor about this. And, and I want for you, hopefully, to be able to talk to your husband about it. Because, because he may be attributing these things to um, false notions and ideas as well. He might be attributing them to all kinds of things, like you really don't want to get better, or he might be thinking that he's the cause of it. Who knows what he's thinking? But the important thing is, is, is for the two of you now to work together, you seeking the counseling you need for these wounds of the heart, but you as a couple seeking counseling for, for the way in which these wounds are affecting your union and, 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 and learning what can be done to help that, okay? Now, look, we're, we're coming to the close of the show, and I want to pray with you, okay? okay. But, 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 you know, and, and, and I, and I want to ask right this moment, Father God, as we come before you, I want to lift your daughter up to you. And I want to ask, Father, that you bring to her in this moment the peace that surpasses understanding. I, I ask, Lord God, that, that, that she's able to take a deep breath. Liz, let's take a deep breath together. <sighs> breathe in and breathe out, right? One more time. In and out. And on the third time, we're going to be picturing ourselves breathing in the peace of the Lord, okay? 
Breathe that in deeply, deeply, deeply and hold it for just a second. And Father God, just let your peace flow through your daughter. Let it flow through your daughter. Come Holy Spirit into all of those frazzled nerves that Liz is experiencing, all of these racing emotions that she is feeling. I just ask, Father God, that through the Holy Spirit now, this this sweet, sweet living water would just come into all aspects of her being, her psychology, her spirituality, her emotional reality, her physicality. Calm her blood pressure, Lord. Calm her nerves. And let her feel your presence, Lord, in a new and dynamic way. I ask that you give her hope, that you imbue within her hope. Help her to hold on to the truths of the faith to own the challenge that she's in, to persevere through prayer and through patience with herself and others and help her to have that expectant faith. Help her to expect that you will intervene. Father, I entrust Liz this day to the Immaculate Heart of Our Lady. Welcome her there, Mother, and place your mantle of protection about her. Liz, when we're off the air, you sit with Our Lady and picture yourself wrapped in her mantle and hear her mother's love. God bless you. Hello? Hi, honey. Hi. Hi, we're off the air. I'm here with you now, okay? Oh, thank you so much. You're welcome, darling. Let's just sit together for a minute here, okay? Okay. We, we, we don't have long. We just have a few seconds. But let's okay. just picture, I just want you to picture our blessed lady with you because she surely is. She's right beside you, okay? <laughs> She's right there. And, you, and, and, and though you don't see her, just know in faith that she's there and that she's got her arm around you and she's holding you very, very close, Liz, to her immaculate heart. And she wants for you to know that her presence is sweet and that she will walk with you through this time, honey. And every time those emotions race, every time these, these thoughts enter into your mind, every time you feel yourself you know, moving out of, out, of, out of control and all of this is taking control of you, just return to her. Just sit, picture her, ask her to hold you, ask her to nurture you, and ask her to reveal her son to you, okay? Okay. All right? Okay. Now, I have to go because there's another okay. show that's about to start, okay? But you're not alone, Liz, because I'm going to hold you in prayer all day, okay? Oh, thank you so much. You're welcome. And remember what I said now, all right? About the I will, I promise. Okay, honey. Hold on. Hold on. Right. Sit with Our Lady, okay? Okay, I will. God bless you, sweetheart. You too. God bless you. Thank Bye. you. Bye-bye, darling. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay. Okay. We better pray for her, okay? Yeah. Yeah. God bless her. Okay. Um, thank you for giving me those couple of seconds. Yeah, you needed I it. it. I know you did. She needed it too. Uh, we will talk to you later. Okay, thanks. God bless. Bye bye. God bless you too. Bye bye. <clears throat> okay. Hey, Jeff. Hey there. <clears throat> How are you? I'm okay. Very emotional last uh, bit of Women of Grace. Oh, I didn't catch it. Oh, well. I saw in the AP some lady saying she needed a miracle or something. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> it was. Oh, oh my gosh! I 